Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our Ultimate Culture webinar series. Uh, I'm Tim Coupler with Human Synergistics, and I've really been looking forward to this specific webinar. Uh, we have with us um, some senior leaders from Axelent uh, Corporation. They are a global culture transformation firm. We've been partnering with them for 12 or 13 years. So uh, they're definitely, definitely not posing as culture experts. They've learned a tremendous amount over their careers, and they're here to share a little bit about what they've learned. Go ahead and submit questions uh, as they arise, and I'll try to work them into the discussions, and then we'll take some questions at the end. But today with me, we have Richie and Silka. Welcome, and please introduce yourself. Thank you, Tim. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, an honor to be here with all of you. Um, as Tim said, uh, we've been doing this, yes, for 15 years now, started, I'm the, one of the founding partners of Axialent, started in February uh, 2003, so it's been already 15 years doing this in the market. It's uh, an honor, a pleasure, and I hope that we can share some stories with you that uh, will uh, you will connect to and that you will find uh, value for yourselves, for your, for your companies, and for your teams. So really happy to be here. Over to you, Silke. Thank you, Richie. Yeah, happy to be here as well. Um, I am. I have been with Axelon for around seven years now, and before that, in the corporate world, uh, mainly in branding and marketing. And within Axelon, I'm responsible for um, impact creation, and my team and myself. So we look after solutions, product development and the, um, the Axelent University, which is the readiness for our consultants. So Richie and I, we work hand in hand uh, with our consultants, with the solutions, and then obviously with our clients. All right, outstanding. Well, and, and what's exciting about your organization is you're, you're global, working across uh, many continents. So you've seen quite a range of different uh, issues and challenges and have learned to, to overcome them. So. Go ahead, let's get started. Yeah, Very so um, like you said, you know, Tim, we, uh, we work globally, so most of our clients have presence all over the world and they are multinational organizations and we work with them in helping them transform their cultures and everything based on that platform of conscious business. So conscious business is, is the philosophy, is our perspective on the world and, and on business. And, and we do believe that if we you know, all together raise the way we do business and we do it in a conscious way, that we can have cultures of excellence, so businesses that are successful, but also cultures of trust and mutual encouragement and where people really thrive and live, live their purpose. Because what is deeply embedded in the work that we do is that in our mission, we want people to, yeah, to really express who they are through the work they do and, and do that in a skillful way, but really connect to that true essence of who they are and the gifts they, uh, they bring. Sounds great. You see a, a couple of our, a few of our clients, not so easy always to make a selection after 15 years, but just to show the, the broad range of the different industries that we work with, uh, different countries, literally from Latin America to Europe, to the United States, to Australia, Asia, um, our clients are everywhere and in, in many different industries. And so that gives us the experience of, of also knowing, okay, there are certain things that work, you know, no matter which industry you're in. And there's patterns that we can say they are important when you look to change your culture. And, um, and that's what we'd like to share. We wanna share what are the levers uh, to change culture, what have we learned, what works, what, you know, what is more challenging. And, and also what's the impact? So how do you measure the return on the investment? Richie, anything you want to add to, to that? Uh, I know I was listening to you, Silke, and I was uh, remembering that, yes, this is our uh, point of view. And uh, one of the things we, we like to say in our workshops to our clients that, you know, it's all about stories. So this is also a story uh, that, that we tell and that we believe in which we believe in and that have 
uh, help other companies. Uh, but please don't listen to this as we, we are claiming that we have the truth on how to shift a culture into a conscious culture, into an effective culture. That's what I was thinking, Silke. So, uh, would, you like, would you like to explain a little bit about uh, this case that we brought and then we get into the how uh, you do uh, what we do? Sounds good. Do you want to go ahead, Richie, or? Sure. Well, th this, is, th this is just one case uh, for you to uh, notice that uh, culture, uh, we, we say that an effective culture is such if it does support the business strategy. So we, we don't do culture change uh, for its own sake. It's always at the service of some uh, strategy execution, which is at the service of the, of the pursuit of the mission with, within you know, ethical values. That's what we stand for. So culture has to support the, the execution of the strategy uh, pursuing the mission. So here, here's just uh, uh, a very, very uh, summarized um, uh, slide that shows that, uh, that the, our intervention uh, had as a consequence reduced stress in, the, in many of the individuals that participated in the program, in the process. There, there, there was increased engagement, motivation, more collaboration, more creativity, and at the same time, uh, as uh, presented by an independent study done in the, in the company uh, to test whether this program was having traction or not for the company, there, there was uh, a savings in excess of $100 million just uh, because people started to behave differently, to adopt uh, different behavioral norms. They started to ask more questions to each other. So decisions became more agile, more innovative, and they could uh, make uh, decisions faster and more effectively. And this resulted in a positive uh, impact uh, on the business. Outstanding. And we worked with about, I think, two and a half to three thousand uh, managers directly, and you know, the, them leading around ten thousand. So it was quite a massive, um, yeah, impact in in the culture, and also then obviously, you know, that that has a, a ripple effect for after the study. And um, but we thought we, we shared we shared this to start with to kind of guide also questions and uh, move into our conversation. Sounds good. And how long did you work with that organization? We, we worked, worked with that about two, two, three years. Yeah, yeah, several years, three years, I, I believe, yeah. at least. Yeah, yeah. All right. So what is so, uh, this slide uh, is? Uh, we, we like to present this slide uh, in our uh, in our interventions, and and normally we would ask people, what do they see here? And, and you get lots of responses. Uh, uh, Tim, if we ask you the question, what, what do you see? What, what, would you, what would you respond? I see a uh, school of fish, Mo most of them moving in the same direction, but a few going the other way, a lot going on there. Some reefs. Yes, absolutely. Water. And, and well, uh, in, in, uh, we, ask, we have asked this question many, many times. And, and very few people notice there is water there. But water is, you know, what, what water to fish is what culture is to organizations because you can't see it until, you know, it turns toxic. Then it becomes very, very visible. So the, the conclusion is that you cannot not have a culture. I mean, culture will develop no matter what. You can choose, however, to have a, a conscious culture, an effective culture, as I said before, that will support the strategy. But you will have a culture because it, uh, we uh, human beings, we are uh, social beings. And as we come together with our, own, with our own stories, we start to develop social stories. And these social stories are developed into culture norms that decide what's accepted, how do we do things around here, uh, what is uh, rewarded, what is punished. So people pay attention to these uh, norms and they adapt in order to fit in. That's, it's as simple as that and then as complex as that. So just real quick, I, I know uh, we see a lot where leaders 
you know, think there has to be some huge problem or some big issue to start understanding culture. And, uh, you know, many are not progressive as far as, yes, every senior leader should be understanding this topic and um, allowing that understanding to influence their decisions. Are you seeing the same thing where people kind of think, oh, I only need to, to work on this if there's a problem? Okay. I think we do. Yes, we do. Certainly. And, and you know, what is an interesting conversation then to have is, um, is to say, well, what is your next level, even if you don't have a problem today? Because what we all know, you know, we all talk about it a lot, is that the, the world will never change as slow as it changes today. It's only going to go faster from, from here on. And so you can actually afford to wait until you have a problem. And so we have conversations with, with you know, our clients around. So what is that next level of performance, of enjoyment in your job, of service to the world, service to your clients? And the moment you start having that conversation is that gap, you know, that doesn't always have to be a problem or a challenge. It can be an right. aspirational gap as well. So, right. but yes, clearly. And, and, and the more you can measure it. I'm sorry. The more you can measure it, yeah, the more you can measure it and the more you can show from the very beginning that, you know, this is where you are right now and this is where you could be. That is a real motivational factor, even for people that say we don't have a problem right now. All right. I, I was good. going to say that one, what, what research is showing consistently, Tim, is that the two most important uh, factors in establishing uh, effective behavioral norms or cultural norms is a culture that's in, innovative towards the insights and then that has adaptability towards the outside. It's precisely because of what Silke has said, the, the world changing at, at an ever faster speed. So the more your culture can adapt to the external and be innovative towards the internal, a much more effective culture you will have. That makes sense. Yeah, many would say you're not even aware of your culture unless you have to adapt to something. Otherwise, it's like the water you're saying. Yeah. Let's yeah. Uh, let's keep going here. So, where do you start? Uh, can Can you move to the next slide? Sure. So, well, what do you start? Uh, and uh, of course. You, we, we recommend you start from what we call the very beginning, which is understanding the current culture. Um, you know, we, we like to say in our philosophy that a problem uh, is not, uh, describing a problem is not a, a reason for intervention itself, because many times people describe all the problems they have, and that gives us information, but does not give us the energy to suggest an intervention. What defines the energy for an intervention is the difference between the description of the problem that the, the person or, or the group of leaders make and co as compared to what do, do they, what would they like to have happen? What's their aspiration? That defines what we call a gap. Without a gap, there is no intervention. So as, as you know very well, because we use uh, the, the human synergistic uh, tools a lot, we, we measure the culture in terms of, of behavioral norms, and, uh, but, but also we measure the, the current uh, condition of the culture, and then we work with the leaders in the room to define what is the ideal culture that you would like to aspire. The, the comparison with, between those two provide us with the opportunity for intervention. So okay. I know you believe in the depth of, you know, the uh, the assessments and the importance of understanding what people value, what's the actual culture and the norms. Well, why over the years didn't you uh, go for the, the quick and dirty survey or the the kind of this is too hard, this is too deep? Uh, shouldn't it just be simple? Uh, you know, what's excellence view on that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, you know, looping back to what Richie had said earlier, kind of what are the elements of culture? I think a lot of the messages that people perceive around culture, they are nonverbal. And mm -hmm. so they, they may not be as obvious. So what you see when you just do a quick and dirty may not really be the root cause. And, and that is our experience. So, you know, we, we do we work with uh, all the tools, we do quantitative, uh, qualitative interviews, and, and we really like when we 
do a diagnostic, we already there look at the depth of what are the mindsets, what is driving people's behavior, and what's the impact of the individual as well, because you need that information when you speak with individual leaders to help them say, you know, um, you are part of that culture and nope. you are impacting it whether you want it or not and um and in order to have that conversation it's like do you want to run your business just on kind of an, an assumption you're like oh let's just see no you don't you do want to have as much data as possible um and so that's been our experience that in the long term it really pays off if you if you pay attention in the beginning okay and you, and you mentioned then, go ahead uh, I was going to say that this integration between the, the quantitative and the qualitative provides a lot of nuance into the source of the behaviors that you are, are, are observing in the company. So, for example, let me, let me give you an example. Uh, one of the questions we would ask in, in your, in your, in, with your instruments is how much, to what extent are people expected to point out flaws in this company? Mm -hmm. and, and then when you dig deeper into that, is that coming from a desire to show up as, as uh, from, from a, a desire to be perfect, from a desire to compete with others, from a desire to please the, the, your, your boss? What, what, what is the origin for pointing out flaws? And, and depending on what people tell you, the intervention can go in very different directions. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the important thing is even as human synergistics, we're not saying do the survey, read the tea leaves, take the actions. No, the the like Silka was saying, it it, it exposes things that you may not yes. be you know talking about or may not even be part of the conversation. You may not have even thought about it, but then when it's combined with the qualitative to to go deeper, as you uh, say, Richie, then then the understanding starts to come. But uh, you can't do the quantitative without the qualitative. The, the quantitative is an option to, to really understand it, but you, you can't solve a problem without doing the qualitative, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we like to say it's simple and not easy. You know, the, the, the instruments, they, they, they look simple, but they, they portray a complexity behind it that you need a deep knowledge of how human beings uh, think, uh, feel, and act in order to be able to intervene with the appropriate levers. Okay. So we had a question come in about how to, to measure the culture and also measure correlation to results and business results. And I'll give a quick answer to some of the things that, that we've been doing lately, and then you can add to that. But, uh, you know, for instance, we have a project now across 2,100 stores. And what they're doing is they're providing us the financial results across all the stores. They're, they're, they're providing sales numbers, turnover numbers, and other things. And we're able to analyze and, and be able to show, well, are the more constructive, inclusive teams and cultures, are, are we seeing better business results or not? So especially with large organizations from the very start, we're often able to show that, yes, you're, you're already seeing some of the, the positive results from more constructive ways of operating, but we haven't found the ways to spread those and to make those things the norm so we can learn internally. So a lot of people think, well, we can use these tools and we have to bring all these new things. Well, no, the, the qualitative and quantitative can understand where there's bright spots, where things are working. So right from the very start, there's measurement and connection to business results. And then, of course, over time, well, we if we have, let's say, 500 of those stores over X performance level now, well, maybe a year from now, two years from now, it can be half the stores or, or whatever it might be. Um, what have you seen as far as um, connections to business performance and, and using the, the culture tools in combination? Richie? Yes, um, I was I was thinking exactly that, Tim. Because in the same way, we have a point of view on what uh, affects culture in a in a positive way, in a way that will support the the strategy execution. I believe that your tools do have a, a very clear point of view, and you say it's better to have more constructive behaviors and less defensive behaviors. And, and we, we completely support that. What we have found is that as the culture, as a leadership, we're gonna talk about leadership in a minute, 
because we believe leadership is the main lever in, the, in, in a company to shift a culture and, and to shift a culture quickly. Because one of the promises that we came into this webinar with is that it doesn't, it doesn't have to take forever to shift a culture. You, you right. can start to work with the senior leaders and we, we like to say leaders cast a long shadow. So as leaders start to shift the behaviors, the way they show up, not what they say, because people don't pay a lot of attention to what leaders say, they will watch very carefully what leaders do. So it's values in action, not espouse values that they will be observing. When that starts to shift, that can create a ripple effect in the organization that helps you shift the company really quickly. Awesome. So, I think, Tim, Tim we've, we've had many of these conversations about the importance of linking any culture work you do to the business straight away, to business processes. So when we work with, you know, with our clients, we look at, so what are the key business processes? You know, is it like, how does business planning go differently in the year after you've had intervention compared to the year before? How are you recruiting? Um, and you really like when you, in particular, when you work with a leader and their team, so we're going to come to that, how you could break that down, then you can really see. So what's the what's the critical business process that if that was going to go better than before, you would really see results. And then you can have an eye on that from the very beginning, like with your example with the stores and and then you can get the data and you know what to measure actually all right well let's continue we already got questions about do you work with leadership do you work with processes and i think in your answers you just uh, talked about both sides being important so let's uh let's go on to the next part what about these 90-day sprints uh, you know you can't change culture fast what why would we even talk about 90-day sprints what's what's this about uh Yes, well, it's about really looking at how the world moves these days. And like you said, the world moves fast. And, and, I, and I think in every organization, you may have people that are the champions for your change. And you have people that are not convinced. And, and it is important to show results fairly quickly. Very few people you know, will say, yes, no problem. Let's just wait three years until we see the results. So the way to work with sprints, what we say is, so let's look at your teams. Let's look at maybe, you know, um, functional intact teams, but also maybe teams around projects. And what are the ones that will have the biggest impact on the business in the coming 12 months? And we identify those. And then we work in 90 day sprints with these teams. And we say, so if the behavior of that team changes, if they do things differently, what's the impact you can see and then you can you know you can work with sprints in parallel you can work with them in different in different functions with different teams and and create a culture change basically break it down from a massive project to smaller projects and see smaller short-term results then then if you stack them they really accelerate the change okay so could you give me an example of how that kind of plays out i think people get the the working yeah. with behavior you're working with process. Mm -hmm. what, what, give me a good example. I, Tim, I want to chunk it down. So, so precisely with an example, I think it, it's going to, you, you're going to notice how simple it is. And then at the same time, it's not easy, but okay. it's really simple. Let, let's say uh, you have come up with some behavioral norms because uh, you want to support a certain uh, strategy execution that we are going to a group of leaders, we, we, they decide together with us, we coach them for that. We're gonna to listen to each other. We are going to uh, build on each other's opinions. And those become what we call the, the standards for, for the team. And, and we establish certain behavioral standards. So once we have set the standards, what happens is we participate in the business meetings as the intact teams run their business and we become because they ask us to become and to, to be the gatekeepers of these behavioral standards so the second step after defining the standards is that as the leader of the team and even as, as a member of the team you demonstrate those standards because if you define them and then you don't demonstrate them let's say the leader starts starts interrupting people not listening to people not respecting people in the meeting 
that, that completely loses credibility. So everybody will go cynical and will not believe that they really want to do that. So demonstrate the standards is a second very important step. And then somebody, let's say one of the team members, uh, there, there's a conversation going on and, and a team member interrupts another team member. And then nobody says something. And then or uh, nobody, nobody raises his hand to say, listen, you are not upholding the behavioral standard that we all agree to uphold. Then comes the third uh, step of, uh, you know, changing a culture norm or behavioral norm, because you explain to them that unless they're willing to demand from each other the, 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 the honoring of the standard, so you define the standard, you demonstrate the standard, but then you demand to each other that people will operate upholding the standard because if you don't do that then the cultural norm will not take uh, roots and then you know you demand that they do the same with their own teams that 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 becomes the behavioral norm for other teams so you delegate the standard and that is what makes the standards uh, the standard go viral so and then it becomes a new embedded cultural norm in the organization so how would sure so how uh we have some questions coming in like well what if the leader doesn't want to change their behavior or where does the individual play into this and individual performance you, you talked about a lot of work with the teams where, where's the individual performance tie in where's leaders that may not want to change how's that play into your process well, okay. the individual plays a very important role. So, you know, so we do work always in parallel with the team and then we work with the individuals through coaching, through, you know, maybe doing an LSI or a leadership impact and to really help them understand what is my impact either way on the culture. And if I'm changing my behavior, what that, you know, how is the impact changing with that? And and it, it really creates, um, I think it creates a beautiful traction also for, for teams when they work together. Um, if, if everybody knows, well, we're doing the work individually because you have to do that work yourself. So, you know, we believe it starts with yourself. It starts with how you influence others with your team and then how it ripples out into the organization. Because, yeah, so very important in our work. So pretty, pretty important concept with the, uh, so you're assessing the org, understanding the gaps, you're working with teams, but not all teams. You're, you're focusing in on some sprints with specific groups, whether that's the top team or a division or whatever it might be. In parallel, you're working with individuals on those teams. So we kind of got that individual team and org work all in alignment. We're trying to shift, shift behavior. We're working with teams and individuals but where's the translating it to action and the the systems the processes like silka was talking earlier where, where's that fit because i believe these these 90 day sprints and at least your language around them's kind of evolved as far as well we've been working with teams but who says they're going to put things into action from a process standpoint and really embed new structures and processes so where's that come into the transformation process Richie, what do you what do you have to say about that side? Yeah, um, if if you mind, I would like to just go one step back because it, I think there was an important question: What happens if the leader doesn't want to change his behavior? Okay, sure. And uh, and, and and you know that happens many times. Uh, and then we have these conversations uh, with the leaders about what I mean, what 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 would you like? What's your aspiration? And what we find is that when you get into into an inspirational conversations uh, conversation, many leaders they want to do a good job, they want to have an impact, they want to leave a legacy that stays there even when they are gone. You know, we confront the leaders with their own uh, with their own sense that we are here for a limited time. So the question is, how do how would you like to be remembered? How how would you like uh, this, uh, the, 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 the people you touch, the clients you touch, the teams you touch, be a little better off once you're no longer there. When you start to engage in that kind of conversations, many leaders uh, start to realize that you don't have to, like in, in the tools, we tell leaders, look, you don't have to 
to, to be assertive, you don't have to be red, you don't have to be aggressive. You can be assertive in a constructive way. It, 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 there, there are blue ways, there are constructive ways of saying what you think, understanding what somebody else thinks, and then negotiate to come to an agreement. So they start to see how they do not have to give up their drive, their, 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 their passion for excellence but they are connected to something that's bigger than themselves. And that many times creates the inspiration for those leaders to want to do the work because the, the, the person that asks the question is, is correct. If the leader doesn't want to do the work, there is no work to be done. But our job is to invite and to inspire the leader that maybe there, there is an aspiration he can fulfill by doing the work. So you've coached them like that. And let's say that works for five out of 10, seven out of 10. But then, you know, the others are going back into the teams and, and you're noticing that, hey, they're not really taking action on what we've talked about. You know, how, how do you hold leaders accountable? And because there, there's always going to be those those outliers, right? Yes. Uh, so let, let, let me respond, Silk, and then, and then you go. Because we, we've had these uh, cases, m many of them. You know, when the leader really does not want to do the work, and, and he does not want to consider uh, other possibilities of looking at the world. Of we, we like to say that we look at the world through filters. And we have a point, some points of view that a, a filter of curiosity is better than a filter of certainty. A filter of unconditional responsibility is better than a filter of feeling a victim of circumstances. Now, if leaders like to blame others for, for their, their challenges, if they don't want to take responsibility, if they, want, if they don't want to be accountable, if they want to continue being certain about the world, at one point, we might just have to walk away because you cannot work with somebody that doesn't want to work with you. Silka? And yeah, what I'd like to add is something that Richie mentioned earlier when, when he gave an example of how we work. So I do think from our experience, it is critical that, that we are part of the business conversation. So in everyday meetings that we, you know, facilitate meetings that, that we are right there where the business happens. And I think that's the opportunity to then also show, you know, really clearly show what's the impact of behavior that changes and what's the impact if you don't want to change. And so I see our job as, you know, as being a sounding board, as helping people uphold the mirror. They have to do the work themselves, and that's pretty clear. Um, but also, so, so you can do a lot. Let's say you do workshops, you do individual work, but really where then the, the rubber hits the road is when the leaders are in their environment and they have meetings with each other and, and we are there and we're able to show them the, the successes, but also the areas where there's still development to be done. And that helps a lot of leaders. And then, you know, but then also you can only do as much as you can do. And then if people don't and, want to. And it's also true, Silke, that some, some leaders, uh, because this has, as you saw, uh, Tim, before, this can have a huge financial impact, uh, a positive financial impact, they get uh, interested because of that. So it's not because you know they believe in being more conscious leaders, uh, and and here we say well sometimes you start doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. But you know once you start and and you can see the benefits of becoming a more conscious leaders leader, you see you, you don't have you don't have to give up the the, the 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 financial impact, and you can do both. But sometimes you just have to start. Um, you have to start the process, and many leaders start it because they want to get better uh, business results. But isn't that the the tipping point you're trying to get to with these sprints is showing results? The results actually precede the culture change because these other groups, these other individuals, aren't want to even aren't want to going to copy the approach or do similar things if it didn't work in the first sprint. So. Is the, is the sprint concept that, that we can actually see results in 90 days enough to be able to at least get other groups encouraged in doing more? Um, or is there some other purpose for the sprint? Um, for, for me, it's two things. It's, it's A, to show results, but also to, to motivate people to do the work. And, um, you know, and, and that happens really fast if you if you're in the business versus 
uh, you do long interventions and people don't quite know where this all of this is going. And, and as we know, you know, um, I think you need to interweave a culture change in a way that, or at least I think that that's beneficial for the business where it's not like yet another thing to do. It's like right. we are running our business. This is what we're hired for. And so our job is to help the leaders to help that inter interweave with with the business. So part of it may be interventions where they go for two days and learn some new skills and behaviors. But part of it is to clearly show it can happen as you're working on the business. So where would the, uh, the I want to make sure we get a connection to the the like the processes that might have to change or the decisions mm -hmm. that the group's making to solve business problems. Where where does that more process side, what we're actually implementing to move the business measure, where does that connect with the leadership, the coaching, and these other things that you've been talking about so far? Richie? Well, there, there are many processes, Tim, that are directly related to the kind of culture you are creating or the culture norms you are creating. So, for example, how, how do you recruit people? How do you hire people? what kind of profiles do you bring into the organization and then how do you compensate people because let's say you're you're, you're trying to create collaboration in in the company and then you bring in long rangers that like to you know to work by themselves and and they are very autonomous people that they don't like to work in teams that is given totally the counter uh, the, the the opposite message of, about what do you really care about and then uh, the the other is the succession uh, process. Who, which people do you promote? Uh, what? What? How do you pay your your bonuses? Those are processes also that, in a way, reflect. They are artifacts that reflect what is important to you. And the way you pay bonuses will say a lot about what kind of culture norm you're trying to create. So would those be addressed as part of the sprints or in parallel with the sprints? What What we would do is, you see. Uh, processes are like artifacts of the culture. In order to, to change a process, we believe that first the leaders, they have to, to shift their, their, we call it a mental models or mindsets, their filters through which they look at the team and at the challenges they are facing. Once they, they, they have shifted those uh, uh, filters, so to speak, then we can support them in engaging in conversations around the processes. They are going to change the processes, but the processes that they are going to get to from a different level of consciousness are not the same processes they would get to from, a, from the prior level of consciousness. So once they're looking with different eyes, then they will come up with many different ideas of, of how to change those processes. And we support them, but it is them that we, we are not process experts. We are experts in supporting them changing the processes. Okay. Let me, if uh, you go, go to the next slide, uh, Tim, because that then speaks to what Richie just said. And so here, you know, you see the how we build, um, you know, our our approaches built on the on the platform of conscious business and what Richie just mentioned is so when you look at the being level, which is the platform, which is your mindset, how you look at the world, um, your attitudes, whether you're more red, green or, or blue. And, you know, as obviously we suggest it is more um, effective um, and leads to better outcomes. If you come from from a from a blue mindset and attitude that then leads to processes and um, and skills that can be applied throughout the organization. And so if I look through a blue lens to speak in, in, in your language, I will uh, define a process in a different way and um, so that's why our work always starts at looking at the mindset how emotional mastery um, how much awareness do you bring to your business and then you look at the skills um, and how you do the, the things the, there is another dimension Tim to this uh, iceberg here that you see uh, has the the human dimension uh, that which is would be the technical dimension so processes they have a technical dimension but they also have a human dimension so what Silke was saying is first we build the process capabilities which is a platform so that it's robust enough so that then 
conversations, the way people solve differences, and the way they execute, which we call impeccable coordination, will be built on, on much more robust uh, process capabilities. And then the processes on the technical side will be affected too. Okay, so you talked about the, the work with individuals, the work with the team in the sprint, you talked about getting kind of, it sounds like an aha, and then more of an understanding and consciousness uh, about their own behavior and what's needed. Where's the shift come to put that into action in the sprints or elsewhere when it comes to the business problems and, and what results you're, you're actually trying to achieve? Is this more of a, a leadership development sprint or is there a, a clear business problem that's being addressed in the sprints? Uh, do I go, Silke? Yeah, go ahead and then I'll add. Okay, well, I, I go and then you jump in. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's it's both. It's both, uh, Tim. Uh, we, we believe first that there is a there is a moment where when we help the team, the the leadership team or, or the impact team become aware of certain opportunities and then they start to practice. And when we practice, we we present all these philosophy, these principles, and these skills, and we use the real business conversations as a background to practice with real situations because that that creates good energy in the room it creates traction people get involved now that's one part that's becoming aware then there's another intervention that we uh, do in the 90 day sprints which is supporting the teams through facilitation while they run the business. So there the foreground becomes a business and then the background becomes all this philosophy that we are seeing here, but it's at the service of the business. So we help them make better business decisions to have better conversations, to decide who's going to do what by when in a form that's impeccable. And that creates a network of commitments that can completely change the way they do business but we do it through facilitation support. And then we have what Silke said before, the individual support. So it's three lines of intervention. It's the workshops, it's a facilitation, and it's also the individual coaching. Silke? Yeah, and, and maybe just to speak uh, about the entry point. So, so the entry point in an organization can then be through the business and the business leaders who say, you know, we have a clear challenge, a problem that we want to work on a gap. Um, but it also can be through um, HR and obviously, you know, from the very top. So there's different entry points and depending on where, where you enter, that's how, you, you know, you build your story of support. And, and I do think it, it differs from organization to organization. So, so one thing that we hold very, um, very dear in Axialand is that we don't have off the shelf solutions. Mm -hmm. We have our, our methodology and our tools, but then it really depends on where the client is at in their journey and what they need and what will create the biggest impact for them in the short and in the long term. Okay. Just an example, a very short example, Tim, so for you to see how this affects the, the way the clients do business. I, I got one client once told me the whole way and said, look, I want to share something with you that because of the work we're doing with you. Uh, something has changed forever in this company. Meetings now start on time. And, and for them, that, that was a huge breakthrough because our experience is that in many of our clients, people are not very conscious of the way they manage time. And then meetings, you know, they start late, then they run longer, and then you get later to the next meeting and everybody gets home late. That has an incredible ripple effect in the organization. So just by meetings starting and ending on time, this was a major shift for them in the way they do business. Such a simple thing like that can completely transform your culture. One thing that you decide to change for, for good. So can you connect this to, to a business problem? So you, you've been contacted because uh, organizations having troubles with uh, launching new products or there's service issues or there's quality issues. Because I think everybody on the line is getting the sense of how the leadership development works, how the facilitation can work, but where are you doing it and, and how are you coordinating it so it impacts the business problem? Well, we, we, what is it, I'll, I'll start and I'll hand over to you, Richie. Like, okay. we believe 
Yeah, and it comes back to our work together also. It is to really do a very good diagnostic at the beginning because there can be many reasons for why you have service problems, right? Or where the quality problems come from. It's not just one answer to that, you know, to that question. So it is in the beginning to look at that. And, and um, I remember a client we've been working with, for them, has, it's been very much about the type of conversations they've had as a leadership team, but then also afterwards uh, with their teams. And, and one thing that, that we often say is you change culture one conversation at a time. Um, and so for them, the, the entire challenge of why they were slower than the com competition was because they were not speaking on, on eye to eye level. So people were coming from different positions and they were talking about this is my position, this is your position, and people were not looking at what is underlying these positions. What's my view of the world? What's your view? What's the interest behind it? And the moment they started breaking that up, they had different insights and they would collaborate in a different way and therefore be much faster in response to, um, you know, to whatever is, was in the market. Um, so that, that's my take on it is you link it to the business problem in the very beginning when you do your diagnostic and then throughout because of course, you know, as you do the work with um, the culture work, different things may pop up. So it's something you you always need to have your finger on the pulse. Okay. Richie. Yes, uh, I I would just add that we we would never act on the symptom uh, thing. Wh wh whatever the the client tells you the problem is, we look at that as a symptom of something. And and so we are we ask a lot of why questions. So we we want to go upstream to understand. You know, uh, the, it's like if you look at the iceberg, the, the client tells you a problem. He's always talking at the at the half product level. So he's talking what can you see above the surface. So what we do is we go upstream or or you know or we go deep to understand what processes might be affected and what's, what points in the platform, in the process capability building, can be affected that gives rise to, to, to that symptom. So we, we ask a lot of questions. Okay. So I know you have some other visuals here. What, what's this all about, uh, Silka? That basically shows what we've touched upon earlier. It's the different levels around um, the individuals or the personal level that plays a role in your organization, the interpersonal level, so the we dimension in a team, but also in an organization, and then the impersonal level, which is uh, which is where a lot of the the um, yeah well the processes and the the business uh, aspects lie. And what we say is in, in all our work, so the model you saw before and this model, they go hand in hand. And, and like we often say, it's a model. So it's a simplification of, of you know, what is really there. Um, but what we say, these three elements, these three dimensions, they go together and they go hand in hand. So in a business, we may have the tendency to only focus on the it level, on the impersonal level, and maybe neglect the we level and the I level. But sometimes when, you know, when we do culture work, we may look uh, very much on the we level and forget that there is an I dimension and there's an it dimension. So it's that question of it needs to make business sense as well, because it's part of why the organization exists. And there's individuals that play a role. So they, those three, they go hand in hand and they are important um, yeah, to, to manage and to, to align. Excellent. So Tell me more about mindsets and behaviors. Richie, you want yeah. to take this? Yeah, well, uh, we, we, this is what we've been in, in some way or another talking about during the last minutes. Um, uh, we, we like to say that mindsets is the, the, the stories you build around what you see out there in the world. Uh, we like to say that uh, we human beings build stories all the time. We build stories. So uh, the, the, what, what becomes problematic is that we see something in the world, we build a story around it, and th then what, what we do is we believe the story because it is our story, so it has to be true. But then what, what's most problematic is that we forget that we have told ourselves a story. And, and then we believe, we walk around 
thinking that what the story we tell is, is what's true about the world. And then, of course, other people tell themselves different stories because they, they come from a different background, they, have, they make different interpretations, they have different values, what's important to me, and they come to different conclusions. What we, uh, what we like to teach and, and, to, and to help people become aware of is that it's not about, the, the stories are not a problem. What, what is a problem is the forgetfulness of the stories. So if we remind each other that they're all stories, then we can enter a conversation with a spirit of curiosity, with a spirit of awe. Oh, look, well, we, we disagree. So tell me more. How do you come to this conclusion? Whereas if I am certain about my story, I will, and you disagree with me, then I will spend our meeting try to convince you that, of course, you know, I am right and you are wrong. And of course, you will try to do the same because you are right and I'm wrong. And then that will get us stuck like this. Uh, if we can remind ourselves that they're all stories, then we can become curious about your story and you can become curious about my story. And together, we can build a narrative that integrates and transcends the stories. But it's so simple and yet so elusive to be able to remember in the moment, in the heat of the moment, that you are just telling a story and that the story could be grounded or the story could be unhelpful for what you're trying to accomplish. And this work on mindsets and behaviors is once you become aware of the, the stories and, and how, do you want to, how do you want to react once you realize it's, it's you have a, a certain narrative, then you can build different behaviors on how, how to listen to each other, how to engage in a, in a difficult conversation, how to give feedback, which is something that happens all the time in our clients. You know, all our clients do is communicate with each other one way or another, one to one, one to many in meetings, in town. If you change the way you communicate and you change the way you make decisions and you, you change the way you commit to each other, that will change our culture. But it's not possible, we believe, if you don't act on the stories that we build, which is the mindsets. Got it. And I Tell think, um, Tim, it, it also speaks to <laughs> something that I've been observing, you know, like if you compare work with culture like 10 years ago and, and today, it's it's a topic that many people speak about in many organizations. So it, it's a you know it's a very popular topic, and the impact sometimes that I see is so that many companies now have very clear vision and mission statements, very clearly values everywhere on the website and in the hallways and you know, and 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 there is an understanding that sometimes is missing that it doesn't take away from us doing the work. And the work is, is being done when we change our mindsets and when we change our behaviors. And that's why we emphasize it so much, um, because the work is not putting a nice poster in the hallway. Um, and, and I think like, you know, the, the people who are on, on this webinar and, and us here, it's part of, of our job and, and what we need to do for the world in terms of we know the impact of, of how, you know, how you change culture in a lasting way versus you know, what's a marketing way of, of just talking about it. So the depth of the work is, is really what is important to us. So what's popular out there now is obviously alignment approaches, you know, aligning everything with your values. Uh, there's, of course, all the emphasis on engagement and, and other things. So, you know, obviously you've run into that so much over the last 15 years. Um, you know, how, how do you help people understand that, that, that working on those things is really not working on culture? <laughs> you're, uh, you're working on things that are just on the surface. How, how do you create that understanding where, you know, maybe that HR leader or top leader, I mean, they even talked about those things being the culture. How, how do you manage that conversation that there's, there is something deeper there? We, we do a lot. Yeah, we do a lot of um, uh, our style uh, in which we engage with the leaders of the teams is very facilitated. So we create what we call moments of truth in the room where, uh, you know, something that's real for the business emerges 
and then we facilitate a conversation right there and then. I mean, we, we never know what's going to come up. Uh, but in the way we do it, we do it in a, we, we model a conscious way, a skillful way of doing it. And then leaders say, what, what did you just do? Well, uh, uh, this is such a different conversation from the, one, uh, the ones we used to have. Then, and then we explain to them, look, we are just having, it does sound like a conversation, but this conversation has a structure behind it. It's like, you know, when you don't know the structure of the conversation, it sounds a little bit like magic because you don't know what, what's going on, but then the outcome is completely different. And then we tell them, look, this magic can be, can be learned, you can learn it, and we can teach you the structure of the magic. But it, at the end of the day, it's just that, it's just having different conscious conversations. Got it. So what, what were you trying to get across with uh, this culture ROI page? Silka? I think that that's what we what we mentioned in the very beginning, just to, you know, to say we do encourage our, all our clients to to measure the return on investments, whatever work, you know, whatever we work, we do together. And it was the, the example we gave uh, in the very beginning. So I think if we do you have a couple of more questions that we could address? Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot here, actually. So you, you talked a lot about mindsets and behaviors, but what about emotions? I mean, it, it's easy when you're in the coaching session and and things are settled, but when we're under stress or, or there's tough decisions that have to be made or lots of pressure, where, where's that play in to what, what actually plays out in your behavior? Yeah. Well, I'm laughing because I just finished an article about emotional mastery like today. Oh. <laughs> and, and so so if you remember a few slides back, we were speaking about this iceberg where the being level is, you know, is at the bottom and then you have the, the doing level and the having level and emotional mastery. We call it is a mass is, is a meta mindset. It's kind of underlying all the other mindsets, because depending on how you work with your emotions and whether you take things personally, whether you are attached to the stories you tell yourself and you believe them and then you forget you know, that these are the stories you made up. Depending on all of that, you will choose how you view the world and which mindsets you take on. So for us, it's very important work and, and how we go about it is to also really look at and say, let's harness the power of emotion and let's be curious of what the message is that positive and you know positive and negative emotions how we sometimes label them as human beings um, have to share with us because they all have a message so it's very important work and and you know Viktor Frankl um, said this amazing sentence where it's like this between stimulus and and response there is a space and in that space lies your freedom to to make choices to make conscious choices and and the work is a lot about um, becoming aware of that space and increasing it. So awareness-based practices, being able to regulate your emotions, being mindful, all of that is a, is a big part of, of the work we do and the work we invite our clients to do. Excellent. So uh, look, we've got another question on, on measuring the ROI. You had said that sometimes the, I guess, the presented problem uh, aren't, aren't the real problems or the underlying issues. But at the end of the day, if you were brought in because we were having quality problems or because we're having, you know, safety issues or customer experience issues, um, how do you measure ROI at the end of, of things if the, the problem shifted or, or do you have to connect things back to, to the original problem? How's that work? Richie, you want to take that? Yes, um, we, uh, we like to recommend, as, as Silke said before, that ultimately we end up measuring impact on the business. So, so ROI is not happy faces at the end of our, of our workshop or that people think this is the best uh, you know, uh, leadership program that they attended. That's not what ROI means. And you have to engage with a client because we influence intermediate variables we influence behaviors and then behaviors in turn we influence outcomes so if you want to establish how much of the outcome was influenced by your intervention you have to jointly uh, collaboratively uh, move upstream and understand how 
uh, how this translates into the into the ultimate bottom line. And and for that you need to work uh, in a collaborative way with the client, which is what we did with our client with the, the case we presented at the beginning of, of, of our webinar today. All right, excellent. Well, I do want to make sure we finish uh, close to on time here. Uh, where can people learn more about Excellent, your work, some of your thought leadership? Silka, you want to start? Yeah, our website, if you go to the second last slide, I believe, axialand.com, sure. you, um, you will see our website, www.axialand.com. You can also send us an email um, to Richie or me. So, yeah, you can leave that up. Um, okay. Happy to respond and engage in conversations because, yeah, this is just the first conversation. So really happy to respond. Um, and then on our website, you see articles, you see uh, videos, just lots of our work and uh, we love to share. And because what we said in the beginning, what 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 is really important to us is, um, yeah, that we share this work and that we enable people to, you know, to live their purpose and that we all together create more and more organizations that that do business in a conscious way, because we believe business has the power to have a positive impact on the world. And, and it's it's really up to all of us to um, to make that work. So looking forward to engaging with people and and, um, and continuing that dialogue. Richie, any uh, final words of encouragement? Oh, by likewise, Tim. This is really, uh, as as hopefully the the attendees to the webinar can see, this is our passion. We we love what we do, and uh, and we love to engage in these conversations. And uh, we encourage, you know, disagreements, different points of view, because in that richness uh, is where you build, you continue to build a, a pool of meaning. And uh, this is what we are all about, you know, to help people, teams and organizations connect to their true nature and then to express it skillfully. That, that's our mission. Awesome. Well, Richie and Silka, thanks so much. Um, of course, we, we value our partnership with Excellent tremendously, admire you for not only wanting to measure the business impact, but actually knowing whether the culture has shifted and that we're actually measuring attributes of the culture itself. Love how you work across individuals, teams, and the organization. Love how you brought in the sprints as a way to drive learning more quickly um, on things related to business problems so it can be translated not to, you know, just generic things, but more sprints, more and more shorter term goals based on a longer term vision and problems and challenges. So uh, love where you're headed and thanks for sharing a, a little bit of what you learned and uh, we'll figure out ways to collaborate and, and get more of your content out there uh, to both of our audiences. So thanks so much. And thank, thank you, you everyone. That, thank yeah. you everyone that attended. We'll have a follow-up email to you with some links and additional information where you can learn more. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.